All right. Awesome. I think I'll get started now. Um, let me just present. Can everyone see my screen? I'm assuming Grace will let me know if people can't. Um, so hello, everyone. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jin. I am currently a PhD candidate at Stanford, and I'm also one of the founders and program directors at Online Research Academy Polygens, which I'll tell you guys all about in a little bit. And today um, in our webinar, I'm going to be talking to you all about the power of research and how exactly to showcase research projects in your college admissions portfolios and journey. Doesn't matter whether you're a seventh grader or an 11th grader or you've already applied to college, uh, but today I want to talk a little bit about why research um, is so powerful and also how exactly to talk about it in a way that will help you stand out in your whole research process and um, college admissions process. So um, a little bit of um, overview. So I'll first give you a, a, an, an intro um, to who I am and my own background in research. And then I'll go into talking about what research actually is. Cause I think this, this word is so mystified and carries so much weight, um, but very few people, especially in high school, understand what research actually means or what people actually refer to when they say the word research. And then I'll move on to talk about why and how colleges value research and evaluate research components to college applications. Um, from a learning standpoint, how research benefits you all in terms of your own personal and intellectual growth. Um, and then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about how exactly to find mentors to support your research, um, how to develop your own topic, and then finally, how exactly to share and showcase your work with the world and with college admissions officers. And so myself, um, I was born and raised actually in Hong Kong. So I'm an international student um, in the US. Um, I did my undergrad at Princeton. Um, I majored in comparative literature. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, comparative literature is essentially where you study languages and literatures from different cultures and nations and you conduct um, comparative analyses that bring together works from different cultures um, and you do comparative studies of them. Um, and right now I am a PhD candidate at Stanford in the same thing in comparative literature. Um, my focus is on French and Arabic literature coming out of North Africa. It's very specific as many PhD um, research topics are. And I'm looking essentially at post-colonial meaning contemporary um, post-independence works coming out of North Africa and looking at um, the relationship between the French and Arabic language in works of fiction that are coming out of that region. Um, during my time at Princeton and at Stanford, I was pretty heavily involved in what's called digital humanities research, where we use computational tools to look at large corpora of text. Um, and happy to answer questions about that if um, any of y'all are, are humanists um, and are curious about that. And um, in terms of my other research um, interests, definitely post-colonial French literature. I also speak to dialects of Chinese because I'm from Hong Kong. So um, Chinese literature and culture is also something I care very deeply about. Um, I also love tidbits about linguistics and just languages in general. Um, I think I actually got into comparative literature as a research discipline because of how much I loved um, languages. And I actually speak six, so happy to talk more about what languages I speak and what languages you guys love um, at the end of this, this talk. Um, in terms of my own teaching and mentoring experience, teaching is one of my favorite, favorite things, just because I love um, connecting with people and helping inspire the next generation of thinkers and, and scholars. Um, I taught French um, language and literature at Stanford for a number of years. Um, and I also started a prison teaching program during my time in undergrad at Princeton where I taught resume writing and interview skills to um, inmates. And also I've just been in general tutoring and mentoring for the past 10 years of my life. Um, and it's truly one of the most rewarding and fun things, which is also what led me to start the company Polygens, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So um, let's dive in. So what exactly is research and what do people mean when they say the word research? So if you break the word down etymologically, research is literally searching again. So a lot of times when you do research, you're not necessarily expected to do groundbreaking, innovative things that no one else has ever touched before. Sure, there are some researchers who are able to do that, people who are very advanced, who've done a lot of uh, work and learning already, but a lot of research at the high school and even college and sometimes even graduate level is 
looking at existing things in new light and presenting new findings from what has already been figured out or discovered. Um, and it's, you know, a systematic investigation of existing topics that leads to new findings, new discoveries, new perspectives. Um, and a lot of the intellectual spaces that research happens in are uncharted, not necessarily meaning that not like no work has been done in those areas before, but like I said, it's more about looking at things in a new light, defining questions that nobody has asked before, um, reviewing existing literature, being able to apply methods, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, um, experimenting with new tools, software, et cetera, and then posing new questions and hypotheses, um, which is really at the heart of research and experimentation. Um, throughout this presentation, I'll, I'll pause and sort of insert research projects that I've seen my students do at Polygens. So Polygens, as a quick um, <clears throat> interlude, is an online research academy where we pair high schoolers like yourselves with top-notch researchers and academics in any imaginable academic field um, to work on unique research projects. And so since I was talking about, you know, asking questions that never, that people have, haven't asked before in areas that maybe have already been researched, this is a really prime example of one of our students in linguistics and computer science who did a project on <clears throat> using AI and what's called NLP, natural language processing, to look at gender bias in media coverage of 2020 um, presidential uh, democratic candidates um, during the nomination process. Um, and so this student looked at machine learning algorithms, NLP, to, and analyze large corpora of data, media articles, radio scripts, et cetera, to look at how different gendered candidates were portrayed, um, and then wrote a paper, and her abstract actually was accepted to a huge conference called the ACL, Association for Computational Linguistics, um, and this is a 16-year-old, I believe she was a sophomore when she, when she <clears throat> worked with us, um, and she did a conference presentation and a paper. So this is an example of something where her question is a very novel and interesting one. How are different gendered candidates being portrayed in the media? And she devised a project with a hypothesis um, and methodologies to answer that question. And so moving on to why colleges and how colleges value research. So for our ones, which are you know, top tier research, you know, uh, research institutions, um, research really is a way for students, professors, postdocs to collaborate. It's a way for, to bring the community together. It's a way to, um, it's just almost like a cross section where freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and all the way to master's level postdocs can really come together to work on the same problems um, and bring in their own perspective. It's a way also for a lot of universities to make tenure decisions about which professors get to stay, which professors have to leave, about promotions. And as also for R1 universities, a lot of times, sadly, I think for incoming undergrads, research and publications um, are more important than sort of teaching excellence. Whereas for PUIs, which are predominantly undergraduate institutions, think liberal arts colleges, think smaller colleges um, with sort of a, more of an emphasis on undergraduate teaching, research is more a tool um, to teach students how to interact with each other, um, to help students figure out what exactly their, inter their intellectual interests are, and also an opportunity for undergrads to publish alongside professors. So as you guys are thinking about what colleges your, um, make sense for you, I think thinking about how and why different types of colleges value research is a really good way to start. Um, and there are reasons to go to either of these groups of universities, but just know that um, their focus on teaching versus research will vary slightly depending on what kind of institution they are. But in any case, research is at the top and the pinnacle of academic achievement in higher education, whether you're at a liberal arts college or a community college or an R1 research institution. Research is really the way to gauge and um, evaluate academic and intellectual um, maturity and independence. And research, as we all know, sort of plays a big role in enhancing college applications. Um, according to a recent US News and World Report, high school students who have um, an impressive personal project or research project that they are working on independently, so outside of school, outside of extracurriculars from school, um, that can showcase their commitment and ability to execute a successful solo endeavor um, is very important to admissions officers because it, it conveys a kind of self-discipline and, and originality 
that high schools often are not able to cultivate because of you know curriculum that they have to follow and just um, cramped schedules. And so you guys might have the question, you know, like, so how does research come into conversation with grades, test scores, standardized testing? Um, and I think in general with colleges, especially in California here, actually the whole UC system is slowly phasing out standardized testing. With the standardized testing being phased out and with school grades being so subjective and um, unstandardized across the board, the, I think higher education is coming to the, um, to the conclusion that grades are actually often weak predictors for future successes. You guys will have heard lots of stories of how a lot of no Nobel Prize winners actually didn't do very well in school, but they have this you know, intellectual obsession and spark that they follow and ask their own questions, which is how they end up where they are. Um, and also outcomes in terms of um, the way tests, um, whether it's SATs or school exams, IB, um, AP, GCSEs, those really reward rote learning um, rather than really encouraging students to ask their own questions. Whereas at Polygens and in general, sort of the trend of project-based learning, we're really trying to get students to um, ask their own questions. What are you interested in learning about? What, what, what are you curious about? And how are you going to be able to answer your own questions rather than do problem sets and hand them in to your teacher? Um, and so there is definitely a seismic shift in the admissions. Um, going towards independent projects and away from standardized testing. I obviously don't think that testing will, you know, be completely out of the picture just because we need some sort of numerical quantifiable way to compare students across the board and the APs will probably be here to stay for a long while. And so will the IB. Um, but what I'm trying to get at here is that independent projects and the way in which students are able to showcase their genuine intellectual passion is going to become super important and more and more important as we move away from these test scores. And I think, um, you know, as I was mentioning just last year in May, the whole UC system, Caltech, you know, and others dropped the SATs as a requirement. Subject tests are also slowly being dropped across, you know, the West Coast all the way to the East Coast, um, and as well as the essay requirement. And so I think more and more students have to gravitate towards. Um, original ways and creative ways of showcasing where your intellectual spark is. It's no longer relying on numbers, test scores. It's more you get a hand at shaping your own intellectual narrative, which is, I think, both scary and very exciting um, for high schoolers. And today I want to talk a little bit about how exactly you can do that, whether it's through Polygens or through your own, you know, passion project endeavors. And so this, um, Nelson is one of a, a, um, a, former, a former admissions officer at Cornell, um, and I just pulled this quote because I thought it was interesting and, and you would appreciate it, um, where he essentially said that dozens of high achieving students whose applications he's read or whom he's advised over the years were academically superstellar, had great test scores, were undistinguishable from each other, but their applications lacked tangible indication, indicators of their passions. These indicators could be a project, an experiment, a portfolio, a supplemental publication or blog, um, or an endeavor on which they spent substantial time learning, tinkering, creating. And it's really not about having this like amazing publication that you've published with a professor as a high schooler. That's not really what they're looking for. They're looking for like excitement. They're looking for that spark in your eyes that they can't see because they're not interviewing you in person to shine through the applications and shine through those numbers. Um, and that's what we're talking about here in terms of research projects, passion projects that you could engage in to bring your application to that next level. And so I'll do another project interlude here. Another one of our students, um, another STEM student, uh, biology and computational, computational biology, so like bioinformatics. This student was very interested in looking at um, computational analysis of cancer cells. And he worked with uh, Michelle, uh, a postdoc, um, a postdoc mentor of ours, who is currently a researcher at Princeton, um, in computational biology. And they were working on ribosome stalling trends um, and sort of cancer translation. Um, and they looked at a lot of genetic data, did a lot of computational analyses. And this student ended up writing a peer reviewed article 
um, that was accepted and published at the Journal of Emerging Investigators. And the, the uh, JEI, Journal of Emerging Investigators, is a very well-regarded high school research journal that you guys can submit to. Um, they do a lot of really great reviews of papers with students, give you a lot of great feedback. Um, and a lot of our students at Polygen submit to JEI, um, but they don't, they don't only take you know, papers from us, anybody can submit um, with research papers. Um, and I think they mostly take STEM papers. So just as a resource for all of you, this is a student, um, a senior student. Um, and I'll switch gears a little bit just because we've talked a lot about STEM, but the humanities is very <laughs> near and dear to my heart. And I wanna talk about fine arts and creative portfolios as an example of research slash passion projects. And so colleges, um, there are a bunch of colleges that explicitly reference research projects um, in supplemental, supplementary application materials. Um, a, a really great example that um, a lot of people know about and talk about is the MIT creative portfolio. So whether you have um, creative writing samples, um, some of our students have submitted architectural sketches. Um, we've had at Polygen's students working on fashion design projects where they submitted their whole line of fashion sketches and concept ideas as part of their creative writing, um, sorry, creative arts portfolio. There's obviously music uh, supplements that you can be submitting. Um, and so this is another really great way to showcase your creative um, intellectual passions. And a lot of times when students think, okay, fine arts, photography, painting, I don't think of that as research. But if you think about sort of the process of creation and, and the way that you go from ideation all the way to execution, it actually is a type of research. You're sort of discovering something new by asking new questions and just showcasing your thinking through creative means. And so definitely want to encourage all of you to think of creative portfolios as a way to tell a story and to tell um, sort of your own narrative of what your intellectual thinking um, or how it has matured up until this point while you're um, applying to colleges. And um, these are just some you know, traits of a really strong portfolio. It needs to really showcase how you're thinking about the world and thinking and engaging with the materials. Um, it needs to be student driven and obviously not done by some other person. Uh, it needs to be curated and selected. There needs to be a very clear story that you're telling. Um, it should show some kind of evolution of your intellectual um, maturing over the years. Um, and there should be sort of a clear goal story at the end of it um, with you know, plenty of examples that are legible and easy to navigate. Um, one of my students, so personally, I mentored the student through Polygents, he um, submitted, so he wrote an autobiography with me, which is a, a, a big project. It was an 80 page book length autobiography where he um, talked about his struggles with um, cerebral palsy. So he was born with this genetic <clears throat> defect, cerebral palsy, and he wanted to write an autobiography of the first 18 years of his life, detailing how he struggled with the disease and then giving um, inspirational pieces of advice to other kids who are struggling from the same thing. Um, and so this was a creative um, piece that he attached to all of his applications um, as, a, as a sort of creative supplement. And he wasn't even applying to colleges to do creative writing. He was actually a computer science student. But this piece of this creative portfolio added so much more dimension to who he is as a student, as a thinker, as, as a um, blossoming scholar, um, that it really helped admissions officers get a sense of, okay, this is not just another computer science student or just another math student. This student actually is really creative and has has um, had time and devoted time and energy to think about ways to better the world and inspire other students. So even if your creative work doesn't necessarily dovetail into the subject areas that you're applying to do, um, I still really strongly recommend that you showcase it if there's something you're really proud of. Um, in terms of why research um, is important and helpful for you as learners, as lifelong learners, um, it Research teaches a number of things that normal school, whatever that means, um, fails to teach. One is self-organization. How do you deal with, you know, 10 articles that you're pulling from different areas of the world and internet and books? How do you organize those things clearly in your head and also in writing so that your mentor knows what you're talking about, so that your readers know? Um, and how do you keep track of all of these sources, snippets, um, so that you have a clear sort of intellectual roadmap of where your essay or research paper is going. That's number one, high schools don't really, or at least high schools that I've seen um, aren't really able to teach that. 
Second is kind of related, it's time management. You have a mammoth project that you care deeply about. How do you, you know, divvy up your time, your semester, your quarter, um, balancing schoolwork and sports and music with this one passion project of yours? So figuring out a way to not lose momentum and be able to um, carry out this thing that you care about is important. Communication is a huge one. Communicating with your collaborators, with your mentors, um, if you're doing, let's say, an anthropo uh, anthropology um, project or a psychology project, you're dealing with a bunch of surveys. How are you communicating with your users, uh, with the people you're polling? These are all super, super important. Um, and then the fourth thing that is so um, overlooked is resilience. And what I mean by that is you need to be okay with failing because if you're doing research right, you will fail. Um, and by fail, I don't mean... Um, you write you know, a chapter of your paper and your mentor gives you negative feedback. That's not failing. Failing is you design a survey and you send it to hundreds of people and then you realize that there's one really important question that you didn't ask and that you overlooked because of whatever reason. And failing can be really hard and difficult to, um, to stomach emotionally, especially if you're you know, used to doing well in school, used to you know, abiding by the rules, but that kind of intellectual resilience, being able to say, okay, I messed up. I forgot to include this really important question, but it's okay. I'm going to start again and I'm going to make sure I don't make the same mistake. Having that attitude and being able to stand up back again, you know, dust yourself off and, and try it again um, is I think one of the most important things that research and independent projects can teach you because it's not that you have a deadline where like, okay, I failed and I'm just going to submit whatever, whatever I have to my teacher. And then that's it. That's like the done of my, the, the end of my AP capstone, let's say in real research, when it's something that you care deeply about, there's no deadline. It's whatever you make it. And so you have to be okay with failing, with not sort of living up to your own expectations and then figuring out ways to fix it and make sure that the next time around, the next iteration, you are happy with the work that you've produced. And so we've talked a lot about research, we've talked about examples of projects. Um, now let's pivot to how do you find the support to do research independently? And that is, I know that's on probably on a lot of your minds and that is a very scary and um, daunting task just because not being, not having someone to fall back on and not having, having a, an authority figure to lean on is sometimes scary. Um, so from the researcher's perspective, let's say you're interested in working with a grad student or with a professor, a lot of them are actually really eager to pay it forward and to inspire the next generation of scholars yourselves, but they're typically very busy. They typically don't check their emails as much, or they usually ignore emails that aren't from their home organizations, um, and they don't have that much time on their hands. And so if you're thinking about approaching potential researchers, collaborators, um, finding someone who has an interest in teaching and mentoring, whether it's you see on their LinkedIn that they've taught a lot before, or you see that they um, teach a lot of classes at their home institution, identifying researchers with the exact right expertise. So not just emailing any random biology professor because you wanna do, let's say plant research and then emailing a cancer researcher, making sure that you do your homework and making, sh making sure that the people you reach out to are um, of the right kind of discipline will be important. Be very clear about what help you need or what, uh, what kind of support you need and also definitely be super respectful of their time. Um, and in terms of like how exactly to, to develop a, pro a project and a, and a topic. Um, so at Polygents, um, how we work is you apply with a, with a vague research idea or topic or a research question, and we pair you with mentors that we know are excellent teachers, have the bandwidth, are currently working at research institutions or have a lot of industry experience. Um, so in terms of finding a mentor, you could go through um, platforms like ours, or you can cold email professors as well. But I think the key is how do you develop a topic and how do you make sure that you are really in the driver's seat of this whole process rather than um, your mentor sort of spoon feeding you small assignments or menial tasks as, you know, and you're not acting as a research assistant. You are in the driver's seat of your project. And the way to develop a topic, a question, something that um, is bite-sized enough that you can you know, really um, manage over the course of, let's say a semester or a year, is by reading a lot. Reading a lot around adjacent topics of the topic that you're interested in, 
um, making sure that you keep good notes and keep track of all the materials and sources that you're looking at, conversations you have with people, um, making sure that you um, talk to people about your interests. They'll, they might be able to point you to connections of theirs or books that they've read or documentaries they've watched. Um, and be prepared to showcase and talk about what you've learned so far. Because that's one of the first things um, you need to, in order to be successful in, in research is being able to, to uh, rephrase and summarize what you've learned. Because if you're not able to do that, then all of the knowledge is in your head rather than showcased to the world. Um, and then the very last thing is improve and iterate. What iteration means is you do it again and again, and every time you do it, it's slightly better. Whether it's every time you read a new article, you learn something new about your reading habits and how you take notes and how you find these articles. Um, every time you write a chapter or a section of your paper, you know a little bit more about your own writing style, what pitfalls you fall into, um, how exactly to better articulate your arguments. And so a lot of what you do in um, the phase of developing a topic is something that is transferable to the entire research process and writing process. Another project interlude um, from one of our neuroscience students. This student didn't want to write a research paper, wanted to produce a podcast. And that's something at Polydense we really, really encourage. Um, so creative ways of showcasing scientific or you know, humanistic inquiry. So this student was very interested in memory loss and um, how Alzheimer's and dementia causes memory loss. And so she ended up reading a lot of scientific articles, summarizing some of the key findings. She had some questions of her own that she wanted to ask. And she produced a very high quality seven episode podcast that explains what memories are, um, how they are neurologically affected by disorders like amnesia, dementia, Alzheimer's, and also addressing medical, ethical, scientific, uh, social aspects of this phenomenon that is memory. Um, and her podcast is called Foggy Minds. Um, you can access it on Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, um, any other podcast platform. Um, and I can tell you that this student used this podcast a lot in her admissions process. She talked about it in her supplemental essays. Um, she attached it to a lot of her creative, um, creative uh, uh, supplements um, to different colleges. Um, and it was something that she was really able to fall back on as I am so interested in neuroscience and in dementia. And I wanted to do something to popularize the knowledge that I've learned. Um, and this is the final product that I've created. And like, what a beautiful creative way of showcasing what you love, right? Creating a podcast that anybody can listen to, whether it's a child or a professor um, and sort of making that knowledge accessible. And so going back to um, sort of reaching out to professors, these are some cold emails that we've gotten um, on the Polygens team because the Polygens team is all academic. So myself, I'm a researcher in, um, uh, in literature. My co-founder, he's a researcher in, in physics and um, in invisibility cloaking actually. And so some emails that we've gotten um, that aren't very effective that I'd love to show you so that you can learn from it um, is something like this. Hi, I've just started writing my first article about cloaking. No punctuation. It's been a year since I worked on this. I made simulations with these two things. I do not have a supervisor. Do you know who can guide me? Because of the young age and experience, no one starts to help me. I make team. So examples of emails like this don't work. They're very desperate. It's not clear what exactly you're working on. Um, it's very sort of me centric, like student centric. It's not about how I can potentially help you with your project. It's about always about taking, how can you help me with my project? And the project that he's working on isn't even clear, right? Like he doesn't say what, um, what research topic, what question he's asking, what kinds of quantitative analysis he's doing, etc. cetera. Um, this is um, an excerpt from a slightly better cold email. Um, you know, I'm very interested in your paper, blah, 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 blah. This signals that they've done their homework. They've at least read something that the professor or researcher um, has written. Um, they are curious and intellectually ready to learn new things. I wanna learn the method to do some research, but I came across some problems concerning this thing in, in his code um, and being very specific, right? Like, yes, this is, this is an equation that I've been looking at and thinking about um, that I saw in your paper that I would love your help on. And um, the ask is very clear 
and also it shows that they've done their homework, that they are um, someone, they, they are an intellectual interlocutor rather than someone who is just asking for, sort of blindly grasping for help, which the previous email sounds like. Um, and the very last few things I wanted to mention, um, these are just some resources for you guys to take down. Feel free to take screenshots, take notes. This, is, this will also be um, recorded. Um, there are a couple of journals that are very friendly to high school work. You know, you know, when you think of publishing, high schoolers often like get really freaked out. Like, how can I ever publish as a high schooler? But that's actually not true. There are plenty of really awesome peer reviewed journals that high schoolers can publish in. The IJHSR, the International Journal of High School Research, um, publishes um, both STEM, humanities, and I think social sciences as well. The Concord Review is a very, very um, prestigious and exclusive um, history paper platform. They only accept around 5% of, of applications. So that's a um, great way for some of our humanists to, to try their hand at. JEI, which I talked about before, mostly STEM, actually mostly biology. Um, Journeys of Journal of Youths and Science, their acronym is Journeys. They're also really great. Polygents has relationships with a lot of these um, publication outlets. So if you have if you're curious about their formatting um, or you know their application cycles, go onto Polygents' website or you know contact me and we can talk more about it. Obviously, science fairs, um, different kinds of fellowships and competitions that you could submit your work to, and also other more creative outlets that don't. Are, are less sort of like deadline specific, whether it's blogging, Spotify. Uh, we've recently had students submit op-eds to CNN, New York Times, local newspapers. Um, there are lots of ways, creative and academic, to showcase your work. Um, so don't be, par don't feel paralyzed and don't be shy about, you know, inquiring where you could potentially showcase your work. Um, and so last thing I'll say about Polygents, which is, which is a platform where you, you can, um, uh, engage in research projects in literally any field. By now we have hundreds of students, all of your age, high schoolers who are engaging in projects ranging from Arabic literature all the way to astrophysics, all the way to starting their own companies with business mentors and back. Um, and so we uh, match you with research mentors who will guide you on your self-exploration path to doing your own research project. Uh, we offer a lot of support in publishing your work, figuring out where exactly to showcase your work. And we also work really closely with schools um, and with college counselors um, to make sure that you're on track and to support you in however you want to showcase your work. Um, and these are some of our mentors. These are some examples of people you could potentially be working with if you come through Polygents or if you, you know, uh, are looking at indiv uh, individually reaching out to these people um, on your own. Um, so we have postdocs um, from all kinds of awesome universities. We have practicing lawyers. Uh, we have practicing doctors. Um, we also have researchers and clinical sort of people who are currently working in labs as researchers, as well as PhD candidates. Um, so a lot of different um, uh, ways to engage with academics and beyond. Um, Polygents has also um, started a partnership with UC Irvine, the University of California, Irvine, to offer college credit for um, Polygents students who are writing research papers. So um, that, if that's something of interest, um, we can talk more about that too. It's a great way, again, to show um, in your college admissions process that you have done college level work through Polygents or through any other program um, and that you can place out of certain things because you've gotten college credit for it. Um, and I will stop here. Um, it's been great seeing so many faces, well, not faces, but seeing so many people um, uh, attending the webinar. Um, really excited to answer any questions you might have. Um, feel free to reach out to students at polygens.org for any questions about applying or research related questions. Um, and this is our number as well, if you wanted to give us a call. Um, I will stop sharing and take any questions. Thank you so much, Jen. That was a great session. Um, we do have a few good questions for you here. The first one is pretty basic. I think a good place to start. Rana is asking, how can I start my research? Yes, that's a great question. So the first thing I would say um, is that you should be thinking about what questions you're interested in asking, even before you start your research. Um, once you've identified, let's say, um, I speak with a lot of students who say, okay, I'm really interested in genetics. I wanna do some kind of research in genetics, but I don't know um, where to start. I would start by 
looking at articles that are recently published in genetics, um, talking to people who are experts in genetics, figuring out, are you interested in looking at, so say a particular disease or a particular, um, or if you're very experienced, a particular gene that you're interested in, and then doing a lot of research around the initial topic that you're interested in, um, then to formulate a question that you'd like to ask. That's how I would go about it. Um, because without really understanding the field, um, it's really hard to know exactly where you're gonna make your contribution, if that makes sense. Fantastic. Um, here's another question, it's very timely, especially coming out of the pandemic. Anoy is asking, um, do you think SATs are going to be optional when applying to colleges and universities this year? Well, that is a million dollar question. I am not an oracle, um, but I will say that whether they are gonna be made optional or mandatory or not, um, they are definitely going to be way less emphasized, I think, moving forward. Um, even after schools, you know, come back in person, even, even after COVID settled down a little bit, I think um, that test scores are going to become less and less important, um, or at least valued less and less, just because of the trend of um, independent projects rising as being a, a, a more indicative um, evaluation of, of a student's performance. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we do have a question that's a little specific, but I think it speaks to a broader question about college admissions. Um, so Martin is asking about what a good college would be that would teach them in-depth knowledge of music production. So um, when you're looking at a college or something specific that you want to study? Do you have any tips on how to find that, that best fit college? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, so I don't know off the top of my head about music, um, about music pr production, but I know that we actually have some mentors who um, are experts in those fields. So looking at, let's say, just looking at programs around the US or abroad that have, that even offer music production as a degree, um, and then seeing if you can talk to some of those graduates, talk to alums, talk to current students and see if they can give you some insight into how they picked this college, what other colleges they were thinking at. Um, I would pro probably stay away from ranking websites just because at least when I was applying to colleges that like really stressed me out, like thinking about, I'd say before I was thinking about like best colleges for literature and like sort of obsessing over those numbers and rankings. I just find that not super helpful, but talking to existing students in those programs, I think is a much better way of going forward in terms of picking the right college fit for you. Nice. Um, and Nomi asks, would a year long research be enough time to maybe publish an article? Yes, that's a really good question. So actually at Polygens, our um, students um, complete their projects typically between three to six months. Um, and obviously, so at Polygens, our programs are 10 sessions long. So that's 10 one hour meetings with your mentor. Obviously you're expected to do a lot of work in between sessions, um, but the, the schedule itself is flexible. Whether you complete it in three months or you have a more ambitious project and you do multiple packages of 10 sessions and you work, for example, for a year. Um, we have had students who've published in three months. We've also had students who took a little bit longer. It really depends on what topic you're working on, um, what your existing level is. Um, do you need to learn a lot of coding before you can fully execute the project? Do you need to spend at least five sessions reading around the topic and subject area before you're ready to actually start writing? So it depends on what level you're coming in at, in at um, but also how committed you are and how much time you have. Um, so that's my answer. Very nice. Um, here's a really good question about research as well. Um, Mark, uh, should we have research that is future career based or it could be anything that we're passionate about? I love this question. And I really, really want to um, reiterate that it really doesn't need to have anything to do with your future careers. Because I think if you're passionate about something now that is kind of different from your envisioned future career, I would encourage you to think, why not make what you're passionate in or passionate about a future career? And the only way to figure that out is to engage in some kind of research in-depth inquiry in whatever you're passionate in, and then see if there's a way for you to you know, eventually make a living out of it. And I think it's actually not preposterous at all to believe and to think of intellectual inquiry as the only good intellectual inquiry that can come out of a research project is one that you're really into, right? Like if, if you're 
if you're doing genetics research because you feel like it's the right thing to do, but you're actually really interested in music production, let's say, you're not going to produce a stellar genetics research project. And when you submit it to admissions officer, it's not going to be compelling the same way it would be if you did a music production project. Um, and so I would always say, follow your interests and your gut. I feel like we don't listen to our gut enough, um, especially in, in terms of intellectual decisions. Um, and you're going to produce 10 times better work if you do something in the topic that you're passionate about. Very great advice. Absolutely. Um, here's a question about an art portfolio. So is an art project or an art research project, is it just a portfolio or are there other ways to showcase, you know, someone's artistic skills if they want to apply to an art school through research? Yeah, so I think the portfolio is definitely a the most traditional way of showcasing, but I also know that there are a lot of schools, like I think actually when I applied to Princeton, there was no art supplement portfolio page. Um, but there are lots of creative ways you can get around it. So for example, in supplemental essays, a lot of our students use, the, use that as space to talk about creative projects and then link it there. Um, a lot of our students add it as a resume line instead of, you know, um, as something that you attach specifically. Um, some of our students have even sent their samples to individual departments um, rather than include it in the main application. It really depends on the college, um, what you know of their department and their admissions um, process. But I would say that um, think through what other creative ways you can showcase your work um, if that particular college doesn't have a art supplement section. Nice. Um, on the other side of the same coin, uh, Kirti asks, if I'm passionate about sports, what would be some starting ideas or questions for research? I am actually so glad you asked this because one of the projects that I'm the most excited about or the, the class of projects at Polygens that I'm the most excited about is sports analytics. And so we have a number of students who are huge sports fans. Think like baseball, basketball. We have a student who's a fencer. Um, and what they really want to do is combine statistics and sports. And we have a number of amazing mentors who have interned and worked with the NBA as, as um, data scientists. Or we have one mentor who's currently working with the NFL. And they're working with these students on looking at sports-related data, looking at how to analyze the data, what conclusions can we draw from this data? Can we put together like a training plan for these athletes, theoretically, given their performance data? Um, and so data science and sports is just one way of putting together, you know, sports and another academic field um, to do a really cool original project that very few high schoolers are even thinking about. Um, we had another student who is a passionate and really amazing professional dancer, um, ballet dancer, and she was really interested in dance science. So biology and dance together. And she ended up doing an amazing project where she started um, the first ever dance science high school blog, where she taught other ballet dancers what sort of ballet anatomy is like, what kinds of injuries there are, um, how to prevent them, um, looking at different scientific articles and educating the ballet community um, at large about how exactly dance science and dance anatomy works. Um, and so these are just two examples of how sports related projects can really become really compelling and really cool. Um, and I'm sure there are a million other ways to explore sports, but those are just two that are off the top of my head. Very cool. Um, we have uh, some questions uh, expressing some frustration about all these factors that are in involved in applying to college and university. And it certainly is a lot. It's a huge process. Um, do you have any insight about why there are so many factors um, or if or if research is even required or maybe what are the advantages of, of using research in this huge arduous process? Great question. I am so sorry that it's frustrating and I cannot imagine how frustrating it is now given that it was already very frustrating when I was applying to college a couple of years back. Um, I think the reason is that there are just so many high schoolers applying that they want to figure out they want to get to know each high schooler as best as possible, but it's impossible when you don't get to sit down and have a conversation with them, right? And they, admissions officers don't have the time for that. There's not enough manpower for that. And so they try to add as many facets as possible to the application to allow you to shine. And so the, I think the way to think about it is not that 
there are these 10 components of the application that are 10 traps that I could potentially fall into. Think of it more as these are 10 ways I could shine and these are 10 ways I can distinguish myself from my peers. And research is just one of them. It's definitely, definitely not required, um, but it is a way for you to showcase um, a side of you that maybe your school transcript and your standardized test scores and your personal essay doesn't fully you know, express. It's a piece of the picture that could be helpful if you wield it correctly um, in terms of completing your profile as a, as a scholar and thinker. Um, I, think they, I think it's this whole college process is inevitably stressful and I don't know of any magical way of making it not stressful, but I would love to encourage all of you to think of it as um, an exciting process of self-discovery. It's a chance for you to figure out what exactly it is you're excited about and how do you best convince the other person that you are excited about it? Because I have no doubt you're excited about, let's say, plant biology, but how do you convince other people who are maybe spending just seven minutes on your application that you are obsessed with it and that you wanna you know, learn more about it? I think that really is the challenge, um, the fun part, but also the stressful part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's a question. Uh, can you remind us what Polygence is uh, what type of research you guys do? Um, and are there any limits in what research can be performed at Polygens? This person is specifically wondering about research in regards to social military studies in international relations um, specifically. Yeah, so Polygens is a online research platform where we connect you high schoolers with researchers from best universities in the US and also industry experts um, to work on projects that you guys propose. So it's not that you won't be a research assistant at Polygens, you won't be helping out with some you know, menial tasks that a PhD researcher is doing. You are coming to us with your own idea and we provide you with an expert in that field to work on those projects. In terms of whether there are limits, the answer is really no. We've had students start companies with their mentors as their research project. We've had students publish papers. We've had students go to conferences. Uh, we've had students publish podcasts. So the final product can really be in any shape or form. Um, the only requirement that we have is that you are genuinely curious about the topic and that you're not doing you know, a school project with us. And we, we, we do not allow that. So all of our students are working on independent projects that aren't for I don't know, like an AP capstone or for some other kind of um, curriculum thing. Um, our only requirement is that you are independently um, driven and excited about the topic. Oh, and your question about, um, sorry, I forgot, international relations. Absolutely. That's actually one of our most popular social science topics. Uh, we have a number of students working on US-Chinese relations. Uh, we have one student working on sort of nuclear, nuclear policy. Uh, we have another student working on Middle Eastern, like contemporary Middle Eastern politics. Um, some of these students are uh, writing papers. We have one student who is very passionate about the refugee crisis um, and the refugee community where he's from. Um, and so he's actually hosting a informational webinar for his community about the refugee crisis um, as his research project. Just some examples. Well, that's very cool. Um, that's fantastic work. Here's a million dollar question from Ariana. What if someone has trouble finding a research topic? Really, really good question. So as um, in addition to finding um, articles and just reading around in topics that you're interested in, I would also suggest, um, um, for example, on Polygence's website, there is um, a projects page that you can just take a look at in terms of looking at what other students have done and what kinds of projects um, they've done. I'm just gonna put the link in the chat. That's one place where you can do some sort of brainstorming. Um, I'm just gonna drop it in panelists and attendees. So polygens.org slash projects is where you wanna go. Uh, by now we have collected, you know, dozens of different projects that you can read, take a look at how they came up with the project. There's sometimes there are interviews with the students. Um, and so looking at other student journeys and how other students have found their topics can be really helpful in addition to doing your own reading. Absolutely. Um, another huge question here. How do you know if a career choice or major to do in college is right for you? 
Wow, you guys are asking some pretty deep questions. Um, I think this is a really hard one to answer and I think it really comes down to gut feeling. So for me, actually, I didn't, when I first got to Princeton, I wasn't, I didn't even know what comparative literature was. I didn't even know it was a major. Like coming from Hong Kong where the curriculum is very sort of like cut and dry and very rigid. Like I didn't even know that comparative literature was a thing. Um, but when I found it, I just immediately noticed that like intellectually, that was where my mind was really gravitating towards. And I could study different languages. I could study different books and, and, and cultures. And um, that just really made a lot of sense to me, even though I had no idea what I would be doing post-college. And I think a lot of times that feels scary because like college is supposed to prepare me for the workforce. I'm supposed to know exactly what my next step is. But I think that's not necessarily true. And I mean, I turned out okay. Um, I ended up deciding to go to grad school and then now I'm pausing grad school to start my own company. And, you know, when you think about comparative literature and like entrepreneurship or like startups, like those two things don't really add together, but it's not really about majoring in something that leads you directly to the dream career path, right? It's about being open-minded enough to explore what you're really passionate about and then being open to opportunities as they arise. Who knows, maybe you'll major in astrophysics and you're thinking you want to, let's say work for NASA one day. And then maybe in college, you realize that like creative writing is your true calling and that you'll you know pause everything and write your first novel. Um, so I think being open is really the answer and listening to your gut feelings. Awesome. Um, can anyone join Legions or do they need to be high school students? Good question. We have middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, and also adult learners. But I will say the majority of our students, um, Polygen students are high schoolers, um, but you can be any age. Great, that's great news. Um, another question, pretty specific, but also interesting. Uh, if a student's already working on a literature review and just need help, just needs help with completing and publication, does Polygence help with that? That's a good question. It depends on where you are at in the process of the literature review and also whether it is for school. So as I mentioned, we are pretty strict about wanting this to be your own independent project. Um, if it's sort of you're at the tail end of an independent project and you just want some help with the actual editing process, uh, we do have sort of smaller packages where because you probably don't need all 10 sessions. Um, so that is a possibility, but we'll have to talk about it on a case by case basis. Awesome. And are there any costs associated with researching with collegians? Yes. So um, we have a sort of a, a two programs. One is our normal tuition paying program and one is our pro bono scholarship program. So depending on um, a given student's um, financial situation, we do offer a lot of scholarships. Um, our programs are in general anywhere between, for the whole program of 10 sessions, anywhere between 1500 to 2500 US dollars. Great. Um, I think you, you may have answered this, but perhaps not. Um, there's an attendee who is in an AP seminar and research is part of that course. If they get a certificate in it, can they consider that as, as a research element in their college applications? I believe so, but you would probably have to check with your school. I'm a little bit less familiar with the AP um, system and I will, it just really depends on how your school structures it. And, but I think in general, AP capstone or AP research is, is considered as research, especially because you do produce a paper or some kind of product at the end of it. Um, but I would check with your school to be, to be safe. Gotcha. Um, and I know you, you mentioned that high school students can publish medical research, but can they publish it without any MD or PhD professor uh, or associate professor's name on it? Yeah, absolutely. So it really depends on the journal. Um, so there are some journals that require students have co-authors or co um, sort of like a mentor's name, but most of our students are indeed submitting their work under their own name because at Polygents, you are meant to write your own paper and nobody else is gonna write it for you. Um, some journals will say, if you're under 18, there needs to be a supervisor's name, sort of a, a supervisor's like support form as well. Um, but most of our students are sole authors of their papers. Awesome, and this is not research specific, but it's about uh, applying to college. Is sophomore year a good time to visit and show interest in colleges and universities or should uh, should we wait till junior year? 
That I think is really dependent on how sure you are about the list that you're you're um, looking at. Um, I certainly did not know what colleges I was thinking about in sophomore year. I didn't even know I wanted to come to the U.S. for college in my sophomore year. So if you're already thinking about it, you're probably like 10 steps ahead of where I was. Um, but I will say don't visit until you have a good sense of, you know, the top, I don't know, five to 10 that you're actually seriously thinking about. Do your research on their programs. Do your research on their alums. Talk to people, professors. Um, look at their course offerings before visiting and don't just blindly visit because you want to, it's sort of like a scientific experiment, right? Like you want each visit to be able to answer questions that you have beforehand. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you, Jen. That is all of our questions. I don't think um, if we have any final questions, attendees, please submit them now for Jen. Uh, otherwise, do you have any final thoughts for us? I'm actually going to leave my personal email in the um, chat. It's just gin at polygens.org. If you have any questions or if you want to connect afterwards to chat more about polygens or about you know college anxieties, I'm more than happy to, to be there for you. Um, the last thing I did want to mention is all of all polygen students, um, they're sort of in this together, meaning we have a community um, of students that come together for social things. You'll be, if you do, do decide to come to Polygens, you'll be joining a, a very vibrant Discord server with students who are thinking about colleges, thinking about projects, um, asking for help on different kinds of things. So um, having a community, whether it's through Polygens or you know your own school is very important when you do research because you need that moral support um, when things don't go well and or when, when you fail at certain things. And so, um, just wanted to put that out there for everyone to know. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I think we have no more questions. Uh, oh, we have one more. Do you have any scholarships that cover the cost of uh, Polygen's costs? Yes, we do offer full scholarships. Uh, full scholarships are only available for U.S. citizens, but we do have them. So apply. Awesome. That's great news. Um, well, with that, if we don't have any more questions from the attendees, uh, I'll conclude the session tonight. Thank you so much, Jen, for an awesome, very informative session. Thank you so much for having me, and it was great to meet all of you. Thank you for your awesome questions.